So today we're going to go over crown, print, uh, crown preparation principles, OK? So how do we grind this tooth down? What are we looking at in terms of parameters? And what's the sequence in which we should probably do this in, OK? So crown prep. How much, so some, these are some of the questions that we had kind of posed in the last lecture, right? Some of the things that you need to learn as you walk out today. So how much do we need to reduce this tooth? Well, what shapes should the junction of the tooth and crown look like? So where should the junction end, or that crown margin end? And how parallel should the walls be? Okay. So the theory is we're just going to grind this tooth circumferentially and a little bit on top. And here's sort of a summary slide. We'll jump, jump back into sort of the details of this, but these are just some of the measurements that we're going to be looking for when you prepare the tooth. Okay. So PFM, porcelain fused and metal. This is also known um, as a metal ceramic crown. You'll see that in some of your textbook. Okay? But the idea is that you have metal underneath and then porcelain on top. All right, again, we'll go over the parameters um, in our grade, grading criteria um, when you guys prep. But I want to give you just a quick outline before we jump into the details about how this works. Okay? So we're just going to go through sequentially and go through all the steps. First step is you want to reduce the central groove. Okay, so you'll take a burr and make a little groove right in the middle. So this is important because your opposing cusp, your maxillary cusp, is going to hit right in that central groove. So you want to make sure you have enough thickness of material there. Okay? And then you want to uniformly take down your buckle cusp. So you're going to take a burr and orient it sideways and then drop it. You notice how it follows the angle of the cusp. So we'll drop that down. Okay? And we'll do the same thing on the lingual. We're going to drop that down. Okay, so on the occlusal surface, now you have reduced evenly um, um, your buccal lingual cuss. On the buccal cuss, pay attention to the contour of your buccal cuss there. If you were to look at it, you would notice that it requires a second sort of bevel there. And we call that a functional cuss bevel. Okay, so you're going to come at it about a 45 degree angle to reduce that part. And then you're going to go in between the teeth. So this view is from the uh, mesial. You can't really see the interproximal reduction until we turn it kind of sideways, which we'll show you in a different slide here. Okay? So you're going to go through interproximally and reduce that tooth structure. Then you're going to jump to your buccal margin. And we want to put a 1.2 millimeter shoulder margin, so a 90 degree margin on that buccal surface. And then on the lingual, we're going to be a little bit more conservative, and we'll explain why in a bit. So you're only going to put a half millimeter, and instead of a shoulder, it's going to be a curved margin. We're going to call that a chamfer margin. Okay? All right. And then you notice towards the occlusal kind of one third, it kind of leans in just a little bit, not as much as on the buccal. So we're going to kind of reduce that. And that's what we call our secondary plane of reduction. Okay? So that's sort of the general outline of the prep. And you see all the sharp angles and points. We're going to refine those and smooth those out. We don't want anything sharp in our preparation. So at the end of the day, that's sort of what a crown prep should look like. Okay? All right. Any questions on that? Should we dive into the details now? All right. So central groove reduction. Right? So this is performed with either a 330 carbide or a diamond. And based on your um, operative class, we know that the carbide is about a millimeter and a half in length, and the diamond is about two millimeters. So pick and choose your weapon of choice. If you're using the diamond, don't go the full depth. You want to go three-fourths of the depth. Because again, we're trying to get a millimeter and a half uniform re reduction on the occlusal surface. So we're going to place that into the central groove. And you're going to extend that out into the marginal ridge and go f as far out as you like. Just don't hit the neighboring tooth. Okay? So this establishes sort of a trough right in the middle of the tooth. Right? So that's going to be a helpful guide for us as we reduce the remaining tooth structure. All right, then we have our, that's our central groove reduction. Then we're going to jump to our occlusal depth grooves. So we're going to start in the buckle. So it's helpful to establish these orientation or depth grooves 
to start a reduction. Because you can imagine if we just started reducing off the top, pretty soon we lose reference of where we started from. right? So if you place your depth grooves, you can see the depth in which you want your uh, reduction to end up, but you still have enough of your kind of original tooth surface to kind of gauge and measure whether your depth grooves were appropriately placed or if you have enough reduction. Okay? So these are little guides. So we're going to take our um, 6847KR burr. So if you, here, one, why doesn't everybody take a, uh, open up your uh, fixed manual? So in the beginning chapters here, let's see where it's at. There's a section on burrs. So yeah, maybe that way. OK, page 13, 14. OK. All right, so this is a list of all the burrs that we have in our burr block. OK, and there's a numbering system that we kind of use. All right. So if you pay attention to the first number, you'll see that it starts with a 6, and it's highlighted green. So you're going to find a green stripe on that burr. So if you look on page 13, a green corresponds with a coarse burr. Okay, so it's a grit size of 125 microns. Okay, and then in the number column, it's 6. Okay, so the first number there designates the grit or the coarseness of the burr. The remaining parts after that, the 847KR, signifies the shape of the burr. So the KR burr is a shoulder. Okay, so you're going to get a 90 degree, more or less, uh, junction there. And then the 018, that stands for how wide the uh, burr is at its shank. So if you look at the lecture there, it's 1.8 millimeters, and that corresponds with the 018. And for these burrs, as you, the tapered ones, as you go down towards the tip, it always converges to 0.6 millimeters less than what the original width was at the shank. So in this case, it's 1.2 millimeters at its tip, which is perfect for us because we want our buckle uh, margin to be 1.2 millimeters, okay? And if you think about right dead center in that burr, that would be about a millimeter and a half, right? So you can use this burr as sort of a gauge as you reduce. You want to sink that burr so that it is reduced about a millimeter and a half, okay? Um, so that's how these burrs kind of work, and we'll walk through some of the other shapes um, as we get to them, right? So this is your 6847KR. And again, the 018 stands for how wide the burr is. And it's always 0.6 millimeters less um, when you get to the tip. All right? So the goal of this uh, reduction is to take your tip and sink that into the bottom of your central groove reduction that you had established at 1.5 millimeters. And you want to maintain the angle of the burr so that it is uniformly reduced, meaning that the inclination of that cusp tip should be reflected by the angle in which you hold your burr. Okay? So where do you put your cusp tips? Well, I like to think of this as sort of a mountain range, and you have peaks and valleys, right? You have your cusp heights, your cusp tips, and then you have your developmental grooves. So if you were to draw sort of where the grooves naturally lie on the buckle, you'd find them in those locations. So usually they'll make three cuts in those three grooves there and drop that down the width of the burr, OK? So that's what we're doing there. Notice the angulation of the burr. We're going to kind of harp on this point over and over again. OK, that gets reduced. And guess what? You're going to repeat the same thing on the lingual surface. So you're going to find those grooves. And where do you want to put those grooves? Well, generally in these areas. So just in between the two cusps and also on the sides. So if you go a little bit towards the mesial and distal, you'll find a little developmental groove um, just off to the side of the cusp heights, okay, or the inclinations there. All right, so we have our lingual reduction. All right, so the steps after putting our depth grooves is now to reduce or connect 
the grooves there. So you're going to complete the buckle cusp reduction. And you do that by starting the burr in the groove. And then as you come and start to connect the grooves, you don't want to come straight across, right? If you come straight across, if you took your burr and you just went zip, what's going to happen to that cusp tip? It's going to be over or under reduced? Probably over reduced. You've taken off more tooth structure than you need it. Remember, the original contour kind of comes up and then down. So as you reduce, when you start here, you want to go in a little bit of an upward direction. And as you come down, you want to come, or if you're starting here and you connect it, you want to go up. If you're starting from here, you want to bring that down, OK? So the idea is that whatever the contour of that cusp tip look like prior to prepping, as you reduce it, it should follow that same contour. So you see almost this V shape here, OK? I don't want to see any flat cusp tips coming straight across. All right? Clear on that? We're going to do the same thing on the lingual, okay? Using the same coarse diamond burr. Now we're going to get into this idea of the functional cusp bevel, okay? So you can also put depth grooves here, like you see, and then you're going to connect those depth grooves on the functional cusp. So for tooth number 30, it's going to be on our buckle. Pay attention to what arch you're working on, because when we jump to the top, Guess where your functional cusp is on tooth number 14? The buckle or the lingual? The lingual, OK? So I don't want to see any functional cusp bevels on your buckle surfaces of tooth number 14. So here's your functional cusp bevel. It's going to be at a 45 degree angle. So here's a good diagram of sort of what we're trying to get at. So you see this angulation here? This should mimic the angle of the opposing cusp tip here. So this line more or less follows this line here. So if you've done everything correctly and you come at an angle, if the junction between your functional cusp bevel and then your original buckle reduction, you're going to end up forming a peak, right? The apex here. That apex, if you were to draw a line from the adjacent tooth's functional cusp to functional cusp, that should be in line with where you have ended your functional cusp bevel. Okay, so that's a good reference for us to use to see if we've done that appropriately. All right, then we're going to go through with our interproximal reduction. Okay? So in this case, we're going to use a 856 burr. And notice how there's no number in front of that three-digit code. So if you go back to your burr block or your burr page on chapter thir page 13, we'll find that the medium grit has no number. Okay? So if you don't see a stripe nor a number on that, that means it's sort of considered a medium grit. But notice the width of the burr at its um, shank. It's 1.2 millimeters, which means the tip is going to be real narrow at 0.6. So we've given you a much skinnier burr to cut through the interproximal regions here. And we do that for a couple reasons. We don't want you to overreduce that area, and we don't want you to nick the adjacent tooth. So the tendency with a big fat burr is to, you know, if you lean it one way or another, it may hit the neighboring tooth, or you may lean it too much and reduce too much in that area. So we start you off with a skinny burr to uh, break the contact. And then you can notice here we leave a, a thin sliver of tooth structure here, right? So use that as a visual aid as you're going through your contact. As long as you see a thin little piece of tooth that, from the tooth that you're preparing, you know you're not hitting the neighboring tooth. right? So just kind of focus your eyes on there. Don't look at the margin, because we're going to clean that up later. Okay? Focus on that interproximal region, the area closest to that neighboring tooth. So generally, it's going to be at that height of contour or where the contact point is. Okay, Just stare at that as you go through. Okay, So you're going to blast through the interproximals. Okay, You're going to come from the side and reduce that area there. All right, so now we're going to go back to our 6847KR burr. And now we're going to put in our buckle reductions. Okay? 
So you're going to orient this burr so it's along the long axis of the tooth. As you reduce this tooth, sometimes you kind of get lost because, well, we don't know if this is real parallel to that. Um, the tooth just looks kind of funny. So you can always look at the adjacent tooth as sort of a reference and kind of reorient yourself and see if I'm uh, upright, not only in a buccal or a mesial distal direction, but also in a buccal lingual direction. Okay? So you're going to want to look at this at differing uh, points. And again, you can put in depth grooves if you want to help establish your uh, 1.2 millimeter margin. Okay? So remember the width here is 1.2, so if you sink the depth of the burr into that tooth, then you know you're at a correct orient uh, reduction. Okay? Um, you can use the burr as sort of a measuring tool to see if you are reduced or not. So you see that little bit hanging off the side of the tooth? That means we're a little bit under reduced. Okay? Um, so that's our buccal orientation or our buccal uh, reduction. So, um, so these orientation grooves are helpful, um, but they're not completely necessary in the sense that since we could always see where our margin is, you never kind of lose sight of your reduction as opposed to your occlusal reduction where once you shave off a little bit of the uh, occlusal surface, you don't have a great reference point of where you started. But here, if you just went through and you just kind of took your burr and went side to side, you can always look at your margin here and measure if you're at 1.2. Okay? So for some of us, it's going to be easier for us to skip that orientation groove because sometimes we get this little wavy kind of margin here, or wavy contour as we try to connect the grooves smoothly. Right? So after you do a few, you'll probably figure out um, what is the most helpful to you. So buckle reduction. And then we're going to switch to the um, 6, 8, so the course, and then the 6, 8, 5. Uh, this is a chamfer or a curved end burr, and we're going to do that on the lingual. So the lingual is much more um, shallow compared to your buckle margin. One area to point out is these line angles here, like I've shown, is an area that is most commonly under-reduced. So we do a great job on the straight facial, straight lingual, and we just kind of zip our way along. But whenever we turn this corner, we always tend to be a little bit under-reduced. So pay attention to these line angles, OK? Uh, it's just the way we, we're sitting and kind of viewing the two. It's harder to gauge whether your uh, burr tip is um, kind of establishing the width that we want. Okay, so our lingual margin. And again, we're going to, as we come up to these, this occlusal third, we're going to tip our bird just a little bit to reflect this little um, curvature that we find on the lingual aspect. And it's definitely not as pronounced as on the buccal aspect. Okay. So there we have an outline of our preparation. So from here on out, we're really just going to refine you know, and smooth out um, our prep, and we're going to keep the same contours. So whatever orientation you held your burr in, you want to hold it in the same one, just with a differing grit of burr. So here, these are the two main types of burrs that we're using in this crown preparation. And instead of the six, we have an eight in front of it, which means it's a fine diamond. Okay? So you could really slow down your hand piece so you have much better tactile control over um, where you're grinding. Okay? And um, we don't want any sharp points. So why do you think sharp points are sort of detrimental or not good for our crown preparation? Okay, so they become areas of sort of stress concentration. So that's going to be extremely critical when we're doing all ceramic crowns. But when we're talking about any metal crown or metal base, like a PFM, which has a metal coping, you generally don't see as many, you know, I've never seen a metal crown fracture before. You'll see them wear, you'll see them have decay underneath. Um, but primarily, the sharp points make it challenging for us to do our lab procedures down the road. So think about our impression material, right? Is it easier to capture an impression bubble free if the tooth is, comes to a sharp point or something a little bit more rounded? Probably something a little bit more rounded because that material can flow a little bit easier. 
Whereas if you have a real sharp corner, it's hard for that impression material sometimes to really capture that without tracking a bubble. So let's say you make a perfect impression. Well, what happens after you make your impression? What's the next step if you're the lab? Or if you're making your own crown, your, your, own, your, your, your own lab tech, what do you have to do? You have to pour that into some sort of stone, right? So imagine stone flowing into this impression and you have a real sharp area. Well, that's another opportunity for a bubble to be entrapped. So it's much easier for the gypsum or the stone to flow into somewhere that's a little bit rounded. Okay? Right? So let's say you did that perfectly, though. Now you have this stone die right? that has a real sharp point. So what do we know about gypsum? So we classify it 1 through 5, right? Remember our dental materials class? Okay, so by what physical property is gypsum classified by? Impressive strength, right? So we learned that for our crown and bridge um, procedures, we're going to pour this into a type 4 stone. So it's pretty hard, but imagine a real sharp point. Well, how fragile is that little sharp point at the very tip? It's very easy for that to get abraded. And think about all the procedures we're going to be doing on this, right? We have to trim the dye. We got to paint the dye spacer, lubricate, fabricate the coping. It's got to come on and off to wax it up. So all these things that we're, as we're handling the dye, if you abrade away some of that tooth structure, right, since it's so skinny and thin at the top, it may alter the contour of our dye. So for those reasons, it's not great to have any sharp, sharp angles. And it's to help make our laboratory procedures a little bit easier. And specifically for ceramic crowns, those become areas of stress concentration, which can induce fracture. Okay. So oftentimes, the junction between your interproximal reduction and then your um, occlusal reduction, this little kind of point here, um, this becomes an area that you have to smooth out to mimic the contour of a marginal ridge, right? So smooth or refine the preparation. Um, so this is found in your chapter manual, and this just goes over our ideal reduction. And again, this is a porcelain fused metal crown. So in our functional cost, we're going to reduce that a millimeter and a half. And then our central groove, again, a millimeter and a half. Non-functional cost, a millimeter and a half. And then our axial reduction, so in this direction here, so this is our axial wall. So if we take a look at the original tooth contour, this direction here, that should be a millimeter and a half on the buckle. Because remember, we've got to make room. So what goes into a PFM crown? There's a metal coping underneath. What's the first layer that we put on that? The first layer that you put onto your metal coping is your opaque layer, and why do we need that? So that we can block out the color of the metal. Then you're gonna layer on your dentin and then enamel layers subsequently. So it requires multiple layers of firings or baking the porcelain. Because remember, it, we have that powder and liquid, we mix it up, right, and we stack it onto that metal coping, and then we place it into the oven for it to vitrify, okay? All right. So we need more reduction on the uh, facial for that reason, and we want it to be flat. Whereas in the lingual, we're actually going to keep this area here in metal. So that's why we can be a little bit thinner on this axial wall and towards the margin. But our occlusal surface is going to be in porcelain. So we still need that non-functional cusp to be a millimeter and a half. Okay? So. If we weren't clear, these are just some of the reductions that we have uh, in a different diagram. So 1.2, 1.5, 1.5, so on and so forth. Okay?